Hello, everyone. My name is John Kalelal, and I am Executive Director at Exed. Exed is one of the largest providers of online customized executive education in the region. And we are proud partners to SC Johnson College of Business, Cornell University. To guide us on this very relevant topic on innovation during a crisis, we have with us from the SC Johnson College of Business, Cornell, Professor Neil Taralo. Over the last few decades, Neil has had a rich experience in Djibouti, South Africa, Germany, Italy, South Korea, and Japan. More recently, I got a chance to work with Neil in Abu Dhabi for an intervention with the UAE government, where he successfully delivered two cohorts of a multimodular innovation ambassador program. While Neil, I did miss meeting you when we were in New York this Jan, I do remember the XED team was working with you when you delivered the Cornell online engagement for PepsiCo this year. The topic for today is how can organizations innovate during a crisis? Interesting question. And a possible retort could be, hey, do we have any other choice but to innovate? That said, there could be several moving parts for building a successful innovative organization. Over to you, Neil, for your comments and insights on this topic. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those kind words. Um, you know, and you posed this really great question. Do we have a choice but to not innovate or to, to, to innovate? And, and the answer is we, we really don't because uh, my thoughts are that if we do not innovate during this crisis, as we think about coming out of this pandemic, um, we, one of two things will happen. We will either lose our market position or we will fi fail entirely. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and my approach to how we should think about innovation differently given our current environment. But first I wanted to let you know a little bit about myself in addition uh, to, to John's comments. Um, I, I have been teaching uh, entrepreneurship and innovation uh, at Cornell University for 10 years. Uh, I've been teaching at the university level for 20 years, but really my entire life has been spent uh, as an entrepreneur. I've owned, operated, uh, bought, sold, invested in well over 20 companies in my lifetime, uh, everything from tech and product development and manufacturing, uh, but most recently, and uh, really the largest component of my entrepreneurial experience has been in the service spaces. Uh, I do not consider myself to be an academic, and, and that means I don't do research at Cornell, but what I do is I take the research that others have done, and I test it, put it into the marketplace, and get a feel for what works and what doesn't work, and then create programs like the ones that I deliver with XED to help companies be more successful as competitors, as innovators, and as good social responsible companies. Uh, I have uh, started, I, I started uh, studying innovation as a graduate student in the early 1990s. Uh, and that's really right when we started to understand this whole concept of innovation. It was very, very early on uh, in the discipline uh, and have, have been uh, working with it uh, since, since that time. Over time, I, I've developed, uh, I think, a very different approach than most people have to innovation. Uh, for most folks, innovation sits within research and development uh, or marketing uh, as part of the, the organization. Uh, my uh, approach is much more holistic, much more broad in, in how we execute on it, and really starts with senior management and human resources and then a little bit later brings in finance before we really start to move towards product development, tech development, or service development. Um, and you'll see how this plays out a little bit as we work through the content uh, that I have here. Now, one thing I, I do wanna say, and, and, and really important to me, I have the uh, live comments that you can type into your screen up in front of me, and I welcome and very much encourage questions as I'm speaking. So please don't uh, just feel like you have to let me go through this entire uh, body of content that I have. When you ask questions, when you get involved, uh, I think we create more and better uh, targeted value for you and my audience. So I don't have a problem uh, moving quickly into questions 
and then back into the, the presentation and the content uh, again as, as we go along. So for the last uh, easily, easily a month, but, uh, but really longer than that, uh, I've, spending, uh, I've been spending a great deal of time outside of the classroom interacting with companies on a global scale, both virtually and in, in uh, live contacts, uh, using Zoom, using the telephone, and talking to them about what they're experiencing and what they're seeing. But perhaps more importantly, uh, I've been interacting with different markets. I've been looking at what people in the marketplace, what our customers are thinking about and experiencing as they've, they've gone along. And, and what I see, and, and really this is what's formulated the foundational component of my, my, my work here with you today, is that value propositions have changed and uh, will continue to change. And those companies who believe that they can continue to innovate and do business as usual as we emerge out of the pandemic, I think are putting themselves in jeopardy. And what I mean by that is that we need to rethink what we have been doing in the past. And, and because I teach both entrepreneurship and innovation, programming that I have and processes that I have developed for innovation connects the two. And I think we're at a time where it's, it's really important that we get back to our roots. And what I mean by that it's, it's time to be an entrepreneur and think like an entrepreneur as we reshape our innovation programs and as we rethink how our companies need to be approaching innovation during this time. Uh, there is an, a very interesting body of research, if you have not seen it yet, uh, that entrepreneurs indeed think differently than the rest of the world. And, and that has since grown into an understanding that people who are successful at innovation share the same uh, characteristics in their thinking and behavior as entrepreneurs do. Uh, it, it's an area of great interest to me these days, and I believe that entrepreneurial behavior really is the secret to great innovation programs. And it's why the processes that I develop bring those two components together to help us innovate. You know, we, we have so many folks and we hear so many things online, on the news, in different ways we're getting information uh, about how terrible the, this environment is that we're in. But the, the truth of the matter is, throughout history and really throughout the world, great business owners have created great new companies in the bleakest of times. And I'll, 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 I'll elaborate on that a little bit and say um, that great innovators have created great products, great technologies, great services in the bleakest of times, because at the very core of what we do is solve problems for people. Uh, Mudit uh, asked a question, can governments think like entrepreneurs? That's a great question. Uh, and, and the truth is they can. I, I was very fortunate to work uh, in a program uh, in Rwanda with the Rwandan government and President Kagame developing uh, uh, policy, public policy that really encouraged uh, entrepreneurial endeavors and uh, small business and free enterprise. The term they preferred to use was free enterprise. This was back in 2000 and I want to say 2007 or eight. Uh, and I have seen um, I have seen governments move in that direction and very successfully, by the way. But it requires a different mindset and a different way of thinking. And, and we can come back to that if we have time. Uh, a little bit uh, later on. Uh, Hosker asks, uh, with the economics of COVID impact, do organizations work to prioritize innovation or head with the proven and tested methods? So here's, we're gonna talk about that right now, Oscar. Um, I think that the if, if you go ahead with what you have, have proven to be successful in the past, you will be challenged in the future. And that's exactly what I'm working with uh, in this content that we're talking about here. So again, great innovators have created great new products, technology, services in the bleakest of times. They've changed the world. And as I look into the marketplace, what I see our customers uh, dealing with is creating these two underlying issues for just about every organization in the world. And I mean that in a very literal sense. It does not matter how big or small your organization is. Two things are, are action. 
The first is what your customers want and need has changed. And when I uh, earlier mentioned that uh, at, at our very foundational element, innovators are problem solvers. The problems that our customers are experiencing, and, and I will define problem throughout this uh, presentation as uh, solving problems for people, but also it can mean, uh, can mean uh, gaps in the marketplace that are not being addressed, unmet needs that customers have, and uh, uh, what they're trying to accomplish as they go about their daily business. So what our customers want and need has changed. The problems that they are experiencing have changed. And most importantly, I think, uh, is that the priorities and the pain level that they're feeling around these things has really changed as it goes along. And that means your approach to managing your business in its entirety must change. But for us as innovators, how we think about innovation and what our process looks like to innovate uh, has also changed as well. So Neil has asked, is job cutting going to be a reality and bringing back profitability? I don't think it has to be. Uh, I think that really forward thinking, I'm gonna replace that term forward thinking with entrepreneurially thinking companies are gonna recognize one important thing about our environment, and that's that it is full of opportunity. While the rest of the world is looking around and saying, oh my gosh, this is terrible, and it is terrible, I don't mean to belittle that, entrepreneurs are moving towards opportunity because we understand, and, and, uh, and I'll qualify that to say, innovators who have entrepreneurial mindsets understand that where there is chaos, where there is change, there lies opportunity. And that's the mindset that we want to have. The title, the subtitle of this, this presentation is developing the right mindset. And this is exactly what I mean. Great question, Sunil, thank you. Um, it really helps us shape how we start thinking about innovation as we emerge out of the pandemic and as that changes. And remember, it's gonna happen in different ways for different countries and different uh, companies. So our business is no longer predictable. We don't have that historical content to go back on and to rely on. Things have changed. We are operating in a time of great uncertainty. And for most companies, our resources have now become constrained. So we don't have the luxury of the budgets for innovation that we used to have. And we need to rethink our approach to innovation programs. And guess what? This is exactly the same environment as a startup company might have. So this is exactly what entrepreneurs deal with as they start new organizations. We are now in that same situation within the context of our countries, our marketplaces, and our industry. Because of that, new opportunities exist. Uh, Budit asked, uh, is, is the risk greater now in a COVID environment so how can we get financing as in India banks are very risk averse, call it with past scandal uh, and witch hunting by government. So I, I will tell you that I, I do not know uh, or I'm familiar with the, uh, the financial environment uh, in India necessarily. Um, but I, I, don't think, I, I don't think that I would be worried about financing as I start up. And I'm gonna give this two areas of context. So if Mudit is asking about starting a new company, uh, what I know as an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter where I am in the world. If I have developed a technology, a product, or a service that delivers great value to specific groups of people, I will always find the resources I need to start the company. The same is true for innovation. If you can demonstrate that you have created innovation that creates great value for a specific group of customers, and I'll add a little context to that, along the lines of the core competencies of your company, trust me when I say this, your company will find the resources to move you forward. The secret is how this all transpires and how this all lays out, and it's why my approach really focuses on the role that HR can, uh, can uh, uh, play as we, as we move through this. Uh, Anand, uh, should we innovate in completely new areas of business or look for opportunities and adjacencies? I like to stick with core competencies. I think that the areas in which your company has experience and is working well 
is the is the right place to be starting out unless you have a very sophisticated innovation program as you go along. That's something that uh, I work with XEd to help deliver to companies uh, how we how we can create processes and programs that give us a lot of different opportunities uh, to innovate. A couple more slides and I'll come back to questions. So just think about this. Think about what we've talked about here. Think about what has changed for all of us everywhere. It doesn't matter how long you've been in business. It doesn't matter how big your company is. It doesn't matter if you're publicly traded and you have stock and all that other good stuff. It's time to act and think like an entrepreneur. That's what we have to do to be successful here. Because what used to be true just six weeks ago is no longer true or is not as relevant as it used to be. Things are going to change and how we approach things are going to change. There are three areas that I see of great concern to every single market around the world. And I'll talk about those as we go along. So let's do a couple more questions. Uh, uh, so would have uh, responded uh, extra uh, company seeking more financing. I think the same thing is true. Um, I, I, can, I can give you the context for, for uh, uh, countries that I'm more familiar with. Uh, in the United States and in Europe, uh, what, what's happened with banks is that we've gotten smarter about what we invest in. And I still go back to this point. Banks make money. So if you're looking for finance through banking, um, and, and, and investors, this is true for investors as well, both make money by lending money or investing money. If they don't lend money, they don't make money. That's their, their largest component of, of revenue for their organizations. So the trick is to understand how banks in your country, in your area, make decisions about lending money and demonstrate to them that the value you're creating for the market is worth the bank investing in in terms of a loan or an investor investing in in terms of an equity investment. Uh, so I really uh, think about those those kinds of, uh, of things. Um, uh, should we be looking for opportunities? So a couple questions are repeating themselves here. I always think about core competencies as I think about innovation, and I try to stay within the core competencies of my organization. Um, honestly, a discussion about moving outside of those core competencies is a much, much longer and deeper discussion, uh, and we'll have to save that for another time as we go along. Back to what's been changing for us, though. Think about the functionality of four primary components of your business. Marketing, operations, human resources, and finance. Um, now, or uh, uh, what it used to be like, our marketing efforts were, were, were much more sustaining. It was about keeping customers, working through the products, services, technologies that we were offering. Our operations were very systematic, very process-oriented. HR had a very structured component to it. And our financing, generally speaking, was internally generated. But where we are moving towards is a startup environment. And these four functions of our company are changing and need to change. And we need to be prepared for it. Marketing is going to go back to being prospecting. It's going to be about finding new customers, new markets, where we can create a fit between the value that we're providing and the needs that those customers have. Our operations are going to be a little bit more chaotic um, uh, uh, until we level this out and understand how things are going to be happening. HR will move from being extremely structured to being much more haphazard. They're feeling it right now in the discussions that I've had with, with HR folks. Uh, we're responding to things differently. We don't have the luxury of planning our hiring to the extent that we did previously. It's going to be more haphazard. And financing, as a lot of you seem to be uh, clued in on, uh, is going to become more external than internal uh, as it goes along. So here's the process, and then I'm going to get back to customers. The first step for us is to get reacquainted with our customers. Some of you who have experience in innovation know the term customer discovery. We're going to go right back to the beginning, and we're going to rethink this. This will give us an opportunity to do one of two things. One is to understand whether our value propositions will continue to remain the same as we move out of the pandemic. And the second is to identify new opportunities 
where we can start to innovate into as we move out of the epidemic, my, uh, the pandemic. My, uh, my feeling is for most companies, the value propositions will have changed to a significant level that we will no longer be able to do things the same way we did. It will not be business as usual uh, as we go along. So getting reacquainted with our customers, re-executing on customer discovery programs is going to be really important. Once we understand these things, we can redefine and realign our value proposition for products, for companies, uh, for departments, and, and particularly with, with respect to the markets and our customers. That's going to be a key component of this. I like to focus on four key areas, and this is going to be a change, I think, for many of you. Um, we'll talk about those four key areas in a second, and then develop a plan with specific goals in each of these four key areas and execute on the fly and correct course as you go. What I mean by that is we're not going to have time to do extensive planning. This is entrepreneurial behavior and thinking in its truest sense. Most companies want to see long extended research plans. We are not in that environment anymore. We need to move to the market quickly to get those leadership opportunities and correct course as we go once we get feedback from our customers on how they feel about the value proposition that we execute on. So um, let's do a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll come, up, uh, come back and break these steps down a little bit as we go along. Uh, some are Indian uh, ask, uh, I keep hearing that agriculture and especially uh, safety goods will grow. Uh, is this true? I think um, in general, health and safety is the number one priority for every market around the world that I've seen. If our value propositions do not contain some level of health and safety, we're going to be missing the mark. Uh, and I think it depends a lot on the company. So your, your point about agriculture and in food service industries, uh, that is a very high level concern. And my recommendation is that transparency is a really important part of creating a strong value proposition in that space. Um, other, co other, other companies uh, producing things, tech, tech companies, safety and security, uh, health and safety is not going to be uh, as high a level priority but it's still going to be an underlying component of the value proposition. So you need to assess that as you're thinking about customers uh, uh, and customer development as it goes along. Vibu asked uh, which sectors will be most relevant in the post COVID area. You know, so uh, a lot of your questions around prediction, I'm going to answer in this way. Entrepreneurial th thinking and behavior, which is necessary for quality innovation dictates that I do not need to predict the future. And therefore, when, when people ask me to predict what things are going to look like, I don't have an answer for them because I don't think that way. Here's what I know as an entrepreneur, that I can control the future based on my response to the market. And I'll explain what I mean by that. It, it, when I try to predict the future, I'm always going to be wrong. And when I try to predict the future, I tend to create and spend a lot of time on research and plans. Entrepreneurs know that that is a long-term waste of time. That if we can do that in a short-term context, we're much better off. So what I'm interested in doing is getting as close as I can to understanding what my customers want and making my move into the marketplace and then moving forward as I go along. So I'm looking right now at every single question that you all are posting, asking me to predict the future. And my answer for all of you is, I don't know what the future looks like. And frankly, I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about how I can get into the marketplace to understand what my customers want because they are creating my future. There's no crystal ball that's gonna tell me what needs to happen. And I'm gonna move to them and, and together, we're going to create the future. We're not going to predict it. That's an important component to innovation and how we're thinking about innovation in this webinar and as we're thinking about this as we go along. So anybody going forward who asks me to predict what's going to happen, I'm going to skip over your question because I've given you the answer. The answer, again, is 
I'm not a predictor, and frankly, I don't concern myself with what I think may or may not happen. I know that as an entrepreneurial thinker, as a, someone who behaves like an interview, like an entrepreneur, as I move into innovation, all I need to understand is what my customers need because I will create the future. I don't need to predict it. Um, so let's break these steps down a little bit as we go along. The first step, reacquaint yourself with your customers. Understand what's going on in their lives, what pain points look like, what are they trying to accomplish. This is going to be different in every country. Uh, and as you emerge out of the pandemic at different times and in different ways, you'll see these things continue to shift. We know this, or I know this for certain. Service-based companies' value propositions will shift faster and more frequently than product or tech-based companies will. So if you're a service-based company, you need to be much more careful and you must pay, must pay more attention to that as you go along. I want to convert customer problems to perceived value. That's my value proposition, right? Aligning our value proposition with our customer needs is really an important component for me as we go about this. Think of our, my business in four separate but connected parts. Here's something that is a different way I'm sure for most of you that will think about this. First is products and services. The second is our customers. The third is our internal business activities. And the fourth is our external business activities. Most innovation programs and innovation activities that I see occurring within companies focus almost exclusively on products and services. And I'll give you a little tip. When you can innovate in internal uh, and external business activities, you are creating greater value with more of a competitive advantage than if you were innovating in products and services. Again, that's a very long topic, um, but we think about it um, as we go along. So I'm really focusing on, on customers here. Everything I do, I'm thinking about customers. Now, when I think about internal business activities, I'm thinking about logistics, I'm thinking about processes, um, but if I'm an HR person, I'm thinking about how do I hire people who think like entrepreneurs? And I'll give you a little tip for those of you who are in HR listening in. It is not the same as hiring people who are going to run and manage your companies. It is a very different mindset that in many ways contradicts what we think about as being a successful hire or a good hire. Uh, in other ways. Uh, again, that's a longer term uh, uh, discussion, but, but entrepreneurs think almost exactly the opposite that most successful senior managers think. And so our hiring pro practices have to change so that we can accommodate those kinds of thinkers and we can build stronger innovation programs. When I have worked with companies and brought human resources into the innovation process early, there is a clear success rate in identifying new opportunities and gaining greater market share. Step four, create a simple plan. And this plan should take more than a day or two. If you're, if you're spending more time than that, you're really not hitting it in the right way. And you're really not understanding it. You need to keep it simple so you can communicate it to others easily and quickly, create goals for each one of those four areas of the business. And remember, it doesn't need to be perfect. And, and here's why. No matter how much research I do, no matter how much planning I do, the minute I make contact with the market, with my value proposition and my new innovation, I will know that it is wrong and I will need to make changes in order to get it right. My goal in doing research and customer discovery is not to be perfect, but to understand what's going on around me in my industry and in my market so that when I see the things that are not working, I have the information that I need to make those pivots and to be successful as I execute. So that's an important component of what we do, and it contradicts the process that most companies have in in uh, in place. Uh, I see a lot of you like my tagline there. Don't predict the future, but create it. Good. I'm glad you like that. That's I have that uh, uh, 
copywritten, by the way. So if you use it, you have to give me uh, you have to give me credit for it, and that's a joke. Uh, but then uh, I do have some uh, some uh, questions here that I think really good. Uh, Pramod asks how to propose the higher cost to customers. What a great question, Pramod. Listen, here's my approach to this: when I'm pricing something uh, that's a result, particularly of innovation. Uh, I want to have a good understanding of what my costs are and what my margins need to be, my profit margins need to be in order for me to successfully execute this for the company. The last thing I look at, the last thing I look at is what my competitors are, are charging for something. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. What I focus on is the value that I'm providing. And the 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 quick answer to, to promote question is I I propose not higher costs, but I propose higher value. And when I get that value proposition to align with my market needs in a strong way, they are willing to pay more for things and I can make more money with it. And my customers are actually happier because I'm really hitting that problem. I'm really solving that problem in a meaningful way for them. So I think value, I don't think cost. If my competitors have a lower price, I do not lower my price to meet my competitors' price. I look for ways to increase value without increasing costs. Um, and it helps me differentiate myself uh, as we go along. Uh, KS uh, asks, can we have one session for HR in the near future? Happy to do that. Uh, talk to the folks at XED. Uh, they, I'm sure they'll be happy to put something together for us. Um, da, 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 da. I think I got all of the questions uh, right now. So let's uh, continue on with our content. So remember, step four, really important. Keep it simple. Create goals. Uh, and it doesn't need to be perfect as we go along. And then the final step is to execute. And this is all about speed and learning and rethinking what you're doing on the fly. So it's about moving quickly. It's about fine-tuning things as we discover what we didn't get right. As we were moving forward, we learn, we change, and we move forward as we go along. It's a continual process. It's a continual process. And to me, the single most important part of this process, that's not fair, I shouldn't say that, an important part of this process is to take time to reflect on what I've learned so that I can execute it properly as I go along. Okay? Um, some, some quick thoughts on innovation uh, as we go along, and then we'll, we'll work. Uh, the, there's about two or three slides left, and, the, and then we'll really get into questions for you um, as we think about things. Um, in, uh, innovation comes in, in four flavors, I call it, or, or four uh, types. Uh, incremental, or some of you may, you may use or know the word sustaining innovation, uh, disruptive innovation, radical innovation, and architectural uh, innovation. Those are four areas of innovation that I focus on in my teaching and also in my execution of, ex of innovation programs with companies. Um, my feeling is that focusing on incremental innovation as we emerge from the pandemic is the right way to do things. And, and what, what, um, what I mean by that is think about our core competencies and what we have created in the past that has been successful for us. And then working in our market through customer discovery initiatives to understand how the value proposition for what has been successful previously for us has shifted. It'll, it'll move, it'll, it'll have moved up or down. And innovating incrementally in that area to make our past successes relevant again. Now, if you're a really great innovator, while this is going on, you're looking for those opportunities for disruption and radical innovation. Interesting fact is that most disruptive innovations emerge from incremental progress. As a matter of fact, almost every disruptive innovation that we can think of has started as an incremental innovation. And the reason that companies miss disruption is often because they don't see the value in the incremental innovation. Incremental innovation takes longer to move into disruption, and it's also often hidden in the, in the incremental component of what we do. The great example of that is Apple's uh, interface and how um, 
uh, how other companies had that interface already developed when Jobs saw it. It was an incremental innovation for them. Jobs recognized it as a way to disrupt an industry and was able to take it and take the concept and move it forward as it goes along. I'm gonna grab a quick question here that I think is relevant. Uh, Rajendra asks, in the absence of data, what could be the customer prospecting way as being duplicating a startup? So this is what we mean by operating in an environment of uncertainty. Great question, uh, uh, by the way. Um, and thinking about that, we do have limited data and we do have limited access to data, but I'll give you a little hint here. Uh, internet usage is at the highest levels it has been in the history of our company, uh, of, our, of our world. In the United States, the numbers are staggering how much more people are using the internet. And what are they doing on the internet? They're interacting in blog posts, they're interacting in chat rooms, they're interacting in specialized environments where they are vocalizing or articulating opinions about things. The, the most powerful form of customer research, in my opinion, and where every innovation program should start is in simple observation and storytelling. So I'm observing people on the internet. I do it every day. I look at what they're saying. I look at how they're behaving. And that becomes my customer discovery. And then I'll do something that my students think is a little bit funny. But some of these folks, I'll actually stalk them online because they're providing interesting perspectives. And I will uh, eventually reach out to them and ask them, explain to them who I am. I'm a professor at Cornell University at the College of Business. And I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about what you're experiencing in this, in this area. And, and, and then get them to tell me stories about what they're experiencing. Storytelling is an incredibly powerful way to, to, to prospect customers and understand customer behavior in the absence of data. And, and I'll tell you, data that is, that is created through surveys, uh, through uh, research that happened uh, historically is not very useful to us. Uh, because what we're in search of here are the things that we, and I'm gonna say this slowly, the things that we do not know, we do not know. So when I teach innovation, when I teach innovation at this stage of the game, uh, surveys are useless for me because surveys help me find information about things I already know. And I'll execute surveys and employ surveys as part of the process much, much later on in innovation. Right now, I'm, a, I'm in discovery mode. I wanna learn the things that I don't know. I want to learn the things that my customers don't know. This is what Steve Jobs was so great at. You know, people thought that he had this crazy ability to look into people's minds and see what they needed before they actually needed it. And that's not true. What Steve Jobs was really great at is observing people and getting people to talk to him about what they were experiencing. And through that, he would identify problems, pain points, gaps in the marketplace that were not being addressed by companies and he would simply solve those problems by incorporating his company's core competency and, and Apple's core competency is solving problems through technology. That's why they were so good. And, and if you change your mindset to that, you don't need the data. As a matter of fact, you don't want the data. You want to discover the data that has not been discovered yet uh, as we go along. So, um, those are the kinds of things I think about as I'm, as I'm thinking about customer discovery uh, and what we're going on. Uh, Naveen asks, with purchasing power surely going down across the world, shall I focus on creating more price competitive products? It, it, you know, Naveen, I'm, I'm going to repeat what I said previously. It's always about value. Always about value. If you start competing on price, what we know will happen in every single industry throughout history is that Competition will increase, rivalry will increase, profit margins will decrease, and you, you then uh, move into a commodity market, which is not a place I want to be in. Uh, I want to create those blue oceans, if you're familiar with that, that body of research. I want to be in a place where there's nobody else swimming, where there's nobody else competing, and I do that through value-based innovation. That's what I'm thinking about as I go through this. 
Um, good, good, good question, though. Uh, Sachin, and, and uh, forgive me if I'm getting the pronunciation wrong on some of your names. Uh, Sachin asks, how to differentiate between competitors if a customer perceives us as the same competitors, but we still niche in our services and first movers in the market? Again, it's about value. When, when you hit that value button the right way, um, it changes how customers and markets in general perceive your company and the product, service, or technology that you're offering. Uh, and, and I think that's why I focus on value uh, the, the way we go along. Pramod asks, what, what is storytelling? Uh, very simple. Storytelling is getting people to, to tell me stories about what they experience. So the, 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 the famous story that we use in innovation and entrepreneurship is if you think about Henry Ford, uh, in the United States, we think of him as the inventor of the automobile. Um, if Henry Ford were to go out and survey people about transportation at that time, the only frame of reference they had was horses because that's how people got around. And so they would have given them information relevant to horses. It would have been, I need a horse that eats less. I need a horse that runs faster. I need a horse that um, that can run longer for longer distances. Um, they don't have the context. But by getting people to tell stories, he sees the challenges that they're having with respect to horses as a mode of transportation, and he can now create something that addresses those things. So it, it, it gets right back to what I said about Steve Jobs and what people thought about Steve Jobs. It's not that he had this magic ability. He got people to talk to him about what they were experiencing. Uh, I do this little uh, uh, exercise. I often teach uh, students in middle school about entrepreneurship and innovation. And uh, I have them do a, a project and they go home and they ask their parents to wash the dishes after dinner by hand. And they simply observe what the parents are, are doing. Uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. They first ask their, their parents questions about dishwashing and their parents give them answers. It's a survey. Uh, the second night, they simply watch their parents uh, 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 do the dishes. They observe them and they write down with notes. And then the third night, they get their, their parents to tell them about what it was like for their parents to wash the dishes. And it is so interesting, even at this level, middle school students, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old boys and girls, what the difference in data that they collect through those simple exercises. Uh, try that yourself at home sometime. It's a really great way to get a good understanding of what I mean by observation and storytelling. These are the two of the first steps in my customer discovery process. The, the challenge that I have with most innovation processes that I see is they move right to uh, interviews. And again, interviews for me are a form of surveying because I'm asking questions and I'm getting answers back. And, and what interviews do is they inform me about what I already know and I'm not ready for that yet. You must start with observation and storytelling if you really want to find those disruptive and radical opportunities in the marketplace as it goes along. Thanks, Pramod, for asking me to clarify that. Uh, KS, again, asks, uh, when we conduct internal surveys, we understand surveys give insight. Is that not right? They don't give you an insight. I'm sorry. I disagree with this. My, my colleagues who teach marketing and I have these wonderful uh, heated discussions about this. Surveys are wonderful marketing tools. Surveys can tell you more about what you already know. Um, surveys tell you what people are doing, but I can tell you why they're doing it. And this is an important nuance. If I understand why people are doing something, I can control the what they are doing. This is integral to me being able to create the future as an entrepreneurial think of a thinker in innovation. So I really work through it along those lines as we go along. Um, I don't mean to say that surveys are not useful. They are absolutely uh, useful, uh, but they're useful when they're executing at the right time and for the right reason as it goes along. So for me, observation and storytelling inform me about what I should ask in interviews and what I should ask in surveys in a, in a very simple way. Um, good question again. Uh, 
Hanuman asks, any example of incremental innovation from the automobile? Like, sure. Uh, an incremental uh, uh, innovation, and, and some of you may disagree with me. I know my students and I have these really long conversations about this in my innovation classes. Um, the electric automobile is, a, is an incremental innovation. It still addresses the same market. Uh, it's just a, an evolution in technology for the automobile industry. Uh, so it is an incremental innovation as it goes along. It's not going to be a disruption. It's not going to necessarily create a new market. That's that's one of the key components to a disruption. The market will still exist. We'll find different ways to use it. There'll be different value propositions that arise out of it. But fundamentally, it's an incremental innovation. Uh, KS asks, how, to, uh, you, uh, how HR could utilize storytelling? Uh, could you, oh, uh, what a great question. So how do we utilize storytelling uh, from an, as an HR tool uh, with employees in the organization? Um, this is a really great question. Thank you for asking it. No, I don't think anybody has ever asked a question like this before me. Um, I use storytelling in many different ways and observation in many different ways. It, it, and it, what I'm really talking about fundamentally is a, is a research methodology called ethnography. And what I have done is taken the ethnographic process and connected it to um, typical research uh, that is much more quantitative. Uh, and that's the front end of my research. That's observation and storytelling. Uh, ethnography was really uh, uh, developed by academics and scientists studying cultures uh, and, and, and studying um, uh, people. It, it just in general. Um, so we, we think about it uh, along those lines, and it is a very passive form and a very qualitative form of research. Um, so I execute this in a lot of different ways. Uh, for instance, I execute it with my students, and this would, it would give you some context for how you might think about it uh, as an HR person. Um, I get my students to tell me stories about how they learn about innovation and entrepreneurship and in their storytelling, I figure out and I come to understand areas that they're struggling with or where I could create more improvement. One of the things, uh, just as a, as a random example, uh, at Cornell, uh, we think that students prefer semester long 14 week courses, but through storytelling and observation, it became very clear to me that my students prefer much more targeted shorter courses, seven week courses. So if they're executed properly. So I'm now in the process of developing uh, and changing all of my courses to seven week courses. So you can use storytelling in a lot of different ways. And I love it because um, uh, I'm gonna use a term here, it, it's a little sneaky. So when my students come into my office to talk to me about grades or getting a job or whatever, I invariably will drop a question in about how they learn about entrepreneurship and innovation and I'll get them to tell me stories about it. Um, and it's a great way to, to discover things that you do not know. That's innovation. That's really the heart of innovation. Uh, can we utilize, uh, so I just answered that question as well uh, for Shifzbia. Uh, Tanuj asks, when people have lesser purchasing power, conveying your product value and compared against price will take some time. Um, so so I, I get what you're saying here. The, 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 the real answer, and it's not a great answer, you may not like my answer, is that you cannot be all things to all people. That if I follow a value-focused innovation program, I am going to give up components, parts of the marketplace. Um, there's no question about that. But, but my experience with value-focused innovation programs is that they create more value uh, they create more profit. They create more loyalty with customers. So I have much longer term relationships with my customers. And I'm serving less people, but actually making more money. I like that. I like to work less and make more money. It's a really great thing, especially when my customers are happy uh, as, as, we, as we do that. Um, do you think COVID has already pushed the industry future work model? I don't know. Uh, Rajesh, and and again, I'll repeat what I said as I as I went forward. I don't really focus on predicting what's happening. I'm thinking about creating the future, and I'm going to create the future by doing customer discovery and understanding what markets are thinking about. The same is true within organizations. You can use it exactly the same way. 
what are the ways you have seen to end to, to seen end to end integration work best when bringing innovations to the market? What have you found to be the keys in combining creativity uh, with info, uh, implementation? That's a really long answer, Rahul. Thank you very much for asking that question. Um, so first, I need uh, I need, and if you'll post it, I'll come back to your question. What you mean by end to end integration? Because people think about that in different ways, and if you uh, Post what you mean by that. I'll come back to it, and we'll we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about creativity a little bit as well. Uh, oh, I disagree. Uh, Rahendra uh, posts most of the societies consumers compare storytelling as a good plan to deceive. No, storytelling has been fundamental in bringing cultures together throughout the history of, of mankind. Um, it, it it is really a powerful way to do that. Can you misuse it? and deceive people, you absolutely can. I don't focus on that. I focus on the great things that storytelling can, can, can make happen. Storytelling is such an integral part of my teaching because it helps people understand the theories and the models that I'm presenting. Um, and, and it also brings people together. When I share my experiences through storytelling, as I've done a couple of times with you all, it engages folks um, and, it, and it helps them understand uh, my heart, my soul. And uh, that's what I want people to see. I'm not afraid of that as an innovator. Uh, it's a really powerful, powerful tool. Uh, but as with anything, what, what does they always say? With great power comes great responsibility. You know, you can always misuse things. Uh, but for me, it's, it's about that focus uh, uh, as we go along. Uh, Chaos asks about uh, links or books on ethnography. Honestly, if you just do a quick Google search on ethnography, You'll get a whole bunch of stuff uh, out there. We did uh, we did a webinar uh, for XED, and I don't know, John, if it's available to folks or not, or if you're making it public, but we did talk about ethnography a little bit in that as well. We're going to back, come back to these quick thoughts, and then we'll wrap up uh, with your uh, questions as we go along. So focusing on incremental innovation is important. Innovate around these shifting value propositions. Listen, I know this to be true. What was important to people six weeks ago is probably less important or not important at all to people now. Value propositions have shifted and service-based businesses have seen those shifts happen, happen faster um, and more frequently uh, when, I, when I say faster um, and, and, and have more impact on the market. Uh, than tech and product. So be very careful if you're in a service-based business. Disruption is going to be hidden. We talked about this. Within these incremental innovations, there has never been, in my opinion, a greater time for disruptive innovation and radical innovation than there is today. Uh, if we think about that in a positive way, if we create processes within our organization to help us move down this path, we are much more likely to take advantage of these opportunities. And then on entrepreneurial thinking, and I hope this will answer some of your questions, uh, I talked about how, how entrepreneurs think and behave differently than the rest of the world. We need to acknowledge that in our HR programs and in our management and leadership programs. It's really an important thing if you want to have successful innovation. Otherwise, innovation just becomes this pedantic exercise that happens over and over again. I see this all the time. Companies bring, I'll, 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 I'll speak a, a little negatively about my, my competition, companies bring universities in and they do these wonderful innovation programs and then they leave, but there's no process in place behind it and it doesn't address the behaviors that need to happen and be encouraged in order for innovation to really uh, uh, be successful. If you've had even any university or any, any consulting company come in and execute a program, you've seen this happen. You've seen your interest and success with innovation jump up, and then over a period of time, it jumps right back down. What we do at Cornell in partnership with XED is create programs of sustainable innovation within your organization. And much of it focuses on my understanding of how entrepreneurs think and behave and how to action that behavior within an organization. It's a key component of innovation. I think it is the secret missing piece to innovation programs. And hiring and managing for innovation requires an entirely different approach 
to hiring and managing that we have traditionally done. Now, I want to be very clear about something, particularly for all of you HR folks listening in and all your managers listening in. Entrepreneurial thinking and behavior is not better than typical thinking and behavior for management. It is a tool that you execute. And my opinion is the greatest leaders that I have seen globally are leaders that can move back and forth be between entrepreneurial thinking and managerial thinking and know when to execute those, those types of behaviors and thinking processes uh, as it goes along. I think HR programs who cultivate both types of thinking and help people understand when they should be executed um, are, are really, really rare uh, 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 HR uh, and, and development programs. Okay, that's all I have for us. Um, let me get to a couple of questions real quick. John, uh, pop in if there's anything that I missed or you'd like to, to see uh, as we go along. Sure, uh, Neil. How Neil do you know? Go ahead, Sorry. John. We have just one question from Sahil from BHEL. Uh, and his question is, uh, have we entered into a new phase of learning and development uh, that is doing it virtually? Uh, what do you see as the uh, future of classroom training? So um, mind you that what I'm, what I'm gonna tell you is the result of my ethnographic research in this area specifically. So I'm a teacher, right? I'm a professor. Uh, how people learn, how we're going to deliver knowledge is an important part of what I do and the value proposition that I create. So I want to be very careful and very specific to tell you that this is not a prediction that I am making. This is the result of an ethnographic process that I've executed and continue to execute on uh, to understand how the value proposition has changed and is shifting for education at, at the level that we're talking about. So for me, it's about college level education, teaching students, and also executive education. Um, I think that there will always be a need for in-person education, but just as companies are beginning to understand the value of uh, virtual offices and giving people opportunities to work virtually, we in the education community are understanding the value of virtual education. So what I am doing, and I'm spending an incredible amount of time thinking about and understanding how the value proposition has shifted. So we, we, we have to teach virtually for a period of time now. And what value looks like. So my students have been wonderful. My, my executives that I've been working with have been wonderful talking to me about what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Uh, you're getting uh, a little bit of that right now as I continue to develop it. So this chat that's going on and a skill that I continue to work on developing is being able to move from the content that I'm delivering to the chat box and move back and forth between the two to engage you at a higher level. So. I do see us moving more towards virtual elements. I think virtual elements will be more and more relevant as we go along. I think for partners uh, of, of mine like XED, uh, creating virtual content that will be connected to in-person is really going to be where the, the new value proposition lies. And uh, it's going to help us because it's going to drop costs uh, and give us opportunities to do more and to deliver more value as it, as it goes along. So yeah, that's a great question. Certainly it shifted. Uh, I for one am working hard to, to increase the level of skill that I have in my online delivery. Uh, I hope this was useful for you. I actually, uh, on Monday of this week, uh, taught innovation, my last innovation class at home here in my kitchen, cooking. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a culturally uh, and ethnically an Italian uh, family. And so I cooked uh, our, our, our uh, pasta sauce and meatballs live with my students. And I connected innovation and innovation lessons and entrepreneurial thinking lessons to that, that session. And the students really enjoyed that. I think there's going to be different ways and different opportunities to do that as we go along. John? So thanks so much, Neil, uh, for this lovely session. Um, for all of you uh, who are listening, 
uh, we will be sending in these slides. Uh, we will also share the link. And uh, we look forward to uh, staying connected. Um, Neil, any final comment before we say goodbye? No, none. You know, this was a quick overview, John, right? And, and you and I know that we go into much more depth in programs that we can deliver together. So folks who are interested in getting into some of these things, I would love to work with some companies in an HR uh, uh, delivery mode here. And I think we could, we could add a lot of value there. Thanks for the opportunity, everybody. Thank you so much for your questions and your engagement. Uh, truly, it's a privilege for me to do these and, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much, Neil. Good day to you. Be well, and stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.